word, when you come to the verb, it's doing work. And, um, and whether it's singular or plural, your sins have separated between you and your God. What we do, that's a doing word, that's a verb. I don't know how they come up with these, these situations. We will not die for Adam's sin. But we may follow Adam's sin into sin. What was his sin, by the way? He didn't believe God. He didn't obey God. Or we could put it the other way, he was disobedient to God. This is, we won't die, I won't die for your sin and you won't die for my sin. If we die, I'm talking about eternally, it's because my sin. I pray to God that that will not be the case for any of us here. That we will have the power of the divine. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Hey, look, Leviticus six, verse four. Another text that doesn't get too much attention, but I think it's a very important one. Six, verse four. So simply, then it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty. I want you to notice, I've had people say, I don't feel guilty. It doesn't matter whether you feel guilty or not. If you sin, you're what? You are guilty. It's a fact. Because he hath sinned and is guilty. Just because you say a, a, a prisoner goes before a judge. Your Honour, I don't feel guilty. Does that change the verdict? Not as if he's a sensible judge. If we sin, we're guilty. And no guilty man or woman will be in the kingdom of heaven. Only the blood of Christ can be the mediator to take away that guilt. And that if we have done something to a man. You know, I had a, a very painful lesson to learn. When I was president of West Indies College in Jamaica, I'd been at a constituency meeting and I was absolutely shocked by the pitiful politics that went on in that and the complicity of the division president. Oh, I was angry. I was really angry. In a, yes, you might say it was righteous anger, but you know, you got to. And I just went and I just bought into this division president and told him it was the most disgraceful thing I'd ever seen in the issues that I had seen in our church at that time. But I could tell mine wasn't righteous anger. You can tell the difference. You know, the red comes up in the, <laughs> under the collar and up in the and you got that burning in your face and so on. But I was on the right side. But you know, the Bible, you know, the Holy Spirit is so good to you. Amen. I mean, Amen. but Matthew 5 come, came back. 
if thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar. Don't you start to argue whether you're guilty or he's guilty or whatever it is. Leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way and first be reconciled to thy brother, then come off with thy gift. And, um, but you know, I fought that. And of course, I left, I was leaving Jamaica anyway to come over to the appointment at Columbia Union College, and I didn't see him down there. But I would see him when he came to the United States for annual council or spring council and so on. Well, when we would meet, we would greet each other, but there was a great big petition. You can feel it. Have you ever had that experience? Hello, how are you? Good to see you again, but you know it's not that way, really. Well, in the 1974 annual council was held at Loma Linda um, Campus Church. On the final night, Elder Pearson, as General Conference President, had a communion service. And a number of the Vice Presidents acted as the deacons for, for it. And Elder Pearson made such an appeal. He said, look, if there's anything between any of the brethren here, now I don't think he knew anything at all about this situation, but um, uh, make it right. Well, I looked across in exactly the same row, but over the aisle. Who do you think was sitting there? This division president. I tell you, I struggled my, but it was his fault. <laughs> you know, here I am, I'm the president of a, a senior college. I'm an ordained minister and I'm trying to justify not going and making it right. Isn't that terrible? Human nature. Uh, that, but that's no excuse, is it? Yes, it's human nature. But some of you might have struggled some of those kind of ways in your life too. And um, so I, when I went back to my motel, knowing that first thing in the morning a driver would come in a car to take me and others that he could fit in at about the same time for the airport, planes leaving, I went to bed. You know, I could not go to sleep. There was no way. I'm tossing and turning three hours later and it was already reasonably late when I got to bed. Well, in the end, I got out of my bed, knelt down and promised the Lord that first thing in the morning I would try to get in touch with him. I didn't know which hotel he was in. I knew he wasn't in the one I was in. And they put you up in number wherever they need you can in those sit sit. So I got up early in the morning and I was calling up this hotel and this hotel in the book, you know, in the region and no, no name like that, no name here, no, you know, how it goes. And suddenly, yes, he is here. Um he is he's number. I'm just about to call honk, honk, honk to leave for the airport. And I knew I had to go. But I knew I had a lot of time because even though I was going for a flight, I was one of the last ones that would be leaving of the ones in that car. So as soon as I got checked in, that's exactly what I did. I called him up. And fortunately, Oh, God's graciousness, he was there. I made no excuse. I said, Elder, I was brought to great conviction of the way I treated you two years ago at, um, down in Jamaica. I want to apologize. I didn't say to him anything, well, you would need to apologize. That's not the point, not the way. But I tell you this, Every time, and he was gracious and thanked me and so on. Whenever we met again, there was a genuine.